And so their attempt to minimize a financial scandal around betting, I suppose, brings us to the other financial scandal involving betting that I want to get to. Um, because this is John Day Porter's story, man. Like, feels, it just feels like the nightmare in ways that the Otani story was merely an appetizer towards, despite John Tay Porter being somebody that I would imagine 99% of America has never heard of before. And so I just want to give you the very brief beats for people who aren't not familiar with John Tay Porter's oeuvre. Um, January 26th, game against the Clippers. Uh, there was increased betting interest on the under for a John Tay Porter prop bet. And the line there uh, for this prop bet uh, set around 5.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, 1.5 assists, also an over-under for made three-pointers, which was 0.5. So we just get a sense of, like, we're not expecting a lot out of this dude, but we can bet on his statistical benchmarks. That evening, he plays four minutes. He leaves the game. The Raptors say there's an eye injury. It's aggravated. He had suffered it actually four days early against the Grizzlies. And John Tate Porter leaves the game having not scored having had three rebounds, having had one assist, and not attempting a three, hitting the under on every single prop. And then playing the next game. And the next game, um, well, the next day, actually, we should say DraftKings Sportsbook, they say that the under on Jonte Porter's three-pointers was the biggest money winner for betters of any NBA player prop from games that evening, okay? This does not feel like it's going to be that difficult to figure out if there was big money on him before he touched the court, why would there be big money on John Tay Porter? The only reason is that somebody knows something. It will be the responsibility of the leagues to investigate that. And I'm assuming if John Tay Porter is found to have been culpable, and I have no knowledge of anything to know that he's culpable, other than this looks awfully odd, and uh, I'm assuming his playing career will be very short after this, and then that will be quite a, uh, um, a deterrent for other people to attempt to do similarly stupid things if, they, in fact, that's what he's done. We don't, I don't know enough about this it. This is where we have to say that we're a DraftKings-sponsored yeah. show, and as is nothing personal, new to DraftKings Network. So this compliment to DraftKings, I would have said even were those things not to be true. The technology and what they're doing working with the leagues, getting the information to the leagues, these companies are doing everything they're supposed to do. Now it's the league's turn. If I'm the NBA or the president of a team, I'm calling up my friend Adam or calling John to call my friend Adam and say, listen, we need to do something because this is the perfect, perfect person to make an example of. This isn't LeBron James. This isn't Shohei Otani. This is John Tay Porter. We need to suspend him for life. Find a if way to fact, find out. If, in fact, I, I, he is I, culpable. I'm going to, okay, we can say if, in fact, he's culpable. I want an investigation right now because the systems we've put in place, I want the fans to know that these systems are working, that when you right. see irregularities, you're contacting us, we're then investigating, and then we're acting on the investigation. There is no way that the under on Jean Tay Porter was the biggest play in the NBA, and then he leaves the game in three minutes. It's just not. It feels. It, it doesn't unlikely. pass the smell test. Yeah. And yeah. this is a time for the NBA to make a move. So a little cleanup. The second game in question was March twentieth, uh, some weeks later. But again, same deal. Only put a couple minutes due to, Ill due to an illness. Heavy bets on his prop unders. Um, and yeah, it ranked super highly in terms of the sports books. Uh, you know, own internal data on, on uh, Here's where the technology needs to get a little better, and I, and I know DraftKings is working on it, as are the leagues. I want to get the information to the leagues before tip-off. When there is irregular betting, would, would anybody be against stopping all prop bets five minutes before a tip-off? Is that, is that not good? Does all the money come within the last five minutes? I don't want to take money out of anybody's pocket. No, but, but these I do are not the, know that. I, the, I think these are the questions about trade-offs that everyone has to contemplate, right? Like, so I, I should point out this too. I, I'm not a, I'm not a natural uh, better. I'm not someone who knows all the ins and outs. But it's obvious to me that a big difference in the era of legalized gambling, which I believe in philosophically, is better than the system that was before, where it was all illicit and, of course, things happened that were incredibly shady and suspicious under that black market regime. The difference of legalized gambling is that now you have this menu of everything essentially seemingly being bettable 
And so Jonte Porter props didn't exist before. Now they do. And so the question is, where do you turn the dials on what minimums you have to hit on time constraints on like talking to Coco before the show? He had this idea, which I thought was very interesting. What if you make it so that you can only bet on props for guys who play X number of minutes in the NBA minimum so that you filter out the guys who can most easily disappear seemingly having done nothing and yet done quite a bit to damage the integrity of the game. I love his idea and there'll be many of many ideas like it and the technology is going to keep getting better. And in theory, the ultimate payoff is getting information to leagues before tip off. And that then eliminates, imagine if the Rockets are told. It took till halftime of the NCAA to get to the referee who had the conflict of interest in the Chattanooga game. You read about, I hope you read about that. Please there was explain. an NCAA referee who got pulled from refereeing an NCAA tournament game because did not disclose the conflict having I, gotten a I don't degree. Pay, as you know, I don't pay any attention to games that don't involve the big, uh, the big conferences. So I'm so unaware it, of the Chattanooga. It took the NCAA until halftime to get this referee pulled. They went into the locker room and said, you can't referee because you forgot to disclose that you have a conflict. So obviously they're one half too late. Ideally, they would have figured this out before the game started. I would think the NCAA getting something half right would be uh, above a average. Such a hater of the NCAA. <laughs> I'm so not a I hater. You are. It's fine. You want the Super League. You want you want you because you're a fan of teams that would be in the Super League. No, no, you you mistake my comments. My comments are are I don't hate the NCAA. I dislike their lack of effectiveness and how long it takes him to make decisions. And the fact that Jim Beheim, uh, and I'm not particularly a Syracuse fan, loses 200 games like six years later um, because it takes them that long to figure out, figure something yeah, half out. Halftime is they actually are, ahead of schedule. Yeah, half, doing that's, great. that's my yeah. point. If they Congrats. Figure this, they figure this out. This is the shortest investigation in the history of the NCAA. So I think that the end of the story is that these prop bets, it's going to continue. It's good business, and it's the league has embraced it and should, but they will continue to work on how to enforce, and that's why I'm watching for discipline because this is, the, as I said, the right a player classic, to discipline. A classic scared straight kind of a character to use to show on presentations in the preseason. You no, know, he's Michael Porter's camp. brother. Yeah. And he, the it, champion who makes a lot of money, who, makes over $30 million a year. Yeah, 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 and it comes from a family who is not, it's, it's not the classic hard up, oh, flag this guy. Although he did have, did have interest in crypto and all that, which is its own red flag, I suppose. But look, the question of like how states and governments regulate this, of course, is also part of the conversation. It's interesting that in New York, right? I believe this is true, Coco. Correct me if I'm wrong in my ear. But you can't bet on college player props because there is some recognition that that's a vulnerable population when it comes to the cost benefit. The logic, right? What we're talking about is truly... We've created all of these, if not entirely new, then certainly ever more conspicuous incentives. And the question is the cost benefit for these individual actors, who is most likely to follow those incentives to a logical conclusion when it comes to personal profit? And so you can have the government step in, you can have the league step in, you can have the sports books themselves step in. And I think all of them are gonna have to figure out we live in an era in which we want this to be legalized. I am not going to go the other way on that. I think like all of these vices that we have in America, disclosure, uh, responsible treatment programs, genuine transparency, and regulation is the solution to marijuana, to drug use at large, to alcohol, to all of the cigarettes, all of this stuff. But it's not fixable when it comes to let's eliminate all the incentives that would want to make somebody I don't know, take the under on themselves. I mean, you're giving the commercial for the, the way our population thinks about regulation and government, big government, government involvement versus not. Because what you're doing is you're just adding, you're adding a group of people or a situation where you want more government regulation. Yes. I, I get what you're saying. And the, the, the trade-off always is to think about is where does that slippery slope end? How involved do we want our government to be? Can't we have the NCAA, the ineffective mm -hmm. NCAA that you can't stand or dislike how slow they are? Which is it exactly? You dislike that they can't effectively govern. I dislike that they cannot effectively govern. 
All right, so he's on record with that now. So we can confidently say that. Wait, who's going to govern when there's no NCAA? The conferences themselves? Yes. And you found that that works? Uh, it'll work for them. I like how we now can we do a whole show on this place? To a deposition because I can't. I I I no, talk but, to John but, but, about but this it, every it, week, it speaks, and he, But this speaks to what we're talking about, which is who is doing the regulating, who is the check and the balance on an economy that is now flush with money that everybody wants, and arguably uh, will never say no to when given the alternative of way less. Yes, and that's why I don't believe that it's DraftKings. It's not their job to figure out how to regulate or punish Porter. So it's their job to give the info, info which be. they've done. Right. And so it you, can't be or can be. Cannot be. Right. I, I think that when it comes to the state question, and by the way, I'm not somebody who wants the nanny state for all of these things. I've just seen the value of taxing, right? Taxing legal marijuana, regulating it versus just having it live on the black market. Um, but to this general concept, uh, no college prop bets uh, in America, the states that don't have those, uh, Arizona, Colorado, Maryland, Massachusetts, Ohio, Oregon, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. So a deeply decentralized approach There's no federal approach. Red and blue everywhere. But you may draw some conclusions about which nanny states like to nanny. Yeah. So I'm fascinated to see where this ends with props. NCAA is trying to figure out a way and they're trying to go the federal route to eliminate college prop bets in all states. And there's, they're going to want some sort of impact statement from the companies right. and from leagues. And it's going to be, it's a tough one. Does, does a company like DraftKings come out against this? Do they come out in favor of it? Are they neutral? I think that the revenue they, they would get from this gets replaced because people want to gamble and they will find different things to gamble on if they can't gamble on college props. I, I'm actually sort of in Pablo's camp here with the nanny state. I wouldn't call it a nanny state. This would politics be, by me. The, this, Cell phone. It, it would be one of the things that all these companies are dealing and the leagues are dealing with now is, I don't know how many states it's now legal in, 35, somewhere between 35 and 40. But I may be wrong. I've read uh, that And there are 35 to 40 different sets of rules. It's inefficient. Yeah. Uh, it would be much better to have, in this case, federal oversight. At one point, I think everybody thought the legislature, the that the legislature at some point would pass, the U.S. Uh, Congress would pass uh, guidelines for uh, online betting, and they have not. Think about the government, that there's certain things that they leave to the states, and we're okay with as, as, as citizens. When we're driving on the highway, one, sometimes it's 70 miles per hour speed limit, then we cross state lines, and it's 65, and we adjust on the fly. There's certain things that we don't want to adjust to. Differences in how airplanes get regulated. Right. We want every state, when I go to an airport, that everybody is treating their planes the same and way FAA. other than Boeing. So you want the FAA. To me, gambling, I don't know that it has to be federally regulated. Mm -hmm. When there's people in different states, you turn your phone on and you say, oh, that's not available here. All right. And then you go on to what is available. So I don't know if this rises to the level of things that need to be federally handled, but it is going to be I'm, an interesting case. Yeah, I'm a Hamiltonian. We would have been better. We would have been better off without the states being quite so powerful, and we see the result of that right now. Uh, and we, we end up with basically two sets of states that do different things. And I'm not positive that's advantageous. I I I, I understand why you're saying that, and we're not going to get too political here. But I think, I think John just alluded to issue. Federalist Number Twenty Eight, yeah, so we are he's... well beyond. <laughs> The point at which we are unpolitical. Yeah. I think that I would rather look issue by issue than make blanket statements the way you're making. That's probably wise. Yeah, I think, look, the question here. I love you, man. <laughs> the question here um, is how do you prevent uh, what used to be an existential risk from feeling like it, right? Let's talk about this from the theater of it. I think David started there, right? You want to make it so that no one worries about this, even though it's now literally a story that comes up every two days. So do we believe that we've gone backwards or forwards in terms of the integrity of the games? I, I would suggest that we've probably gone forward. I think we've gone sideways. I think that these gambling issues have always existed. They were just left undercover for a long time. There were never companies investigating, looking right. at trends, and then reporting them to the league. 
So it's one of those things where there's there's social media, there's video of everything, so people have this strange recency bias. There's a lot more crime on subway in New York is a great one. But if you look at the stats of it, it's actually not the case. Yeah. But every time there is one, we get horrible video of it that we look at, and it's a total nightmare. There are more planes where the tires are falling off. I we just don't know. I imagine, and, and this is semi-informed speculation, so take it for what it's worth. I imagine that the leagues are enforcing and monitoring and punishing even in ways that are not disclosed to the public because the technology is such that, to David's point, you can actually be ahead of this. And I think for that reason, I, I believe that we probably are better definitively than we used to be in protecting integrity of the game. The question is, are the incentives so great that these marginal cases, right? So Dante Porter did not affect the outcome of the game. He affected the historical record from being as pure as it would have otherwise been in the absence of prop bets. And that's what we're losing. Can we stop that while we're also really so much better at preventing game fixing as a factual matter? I think we probably are. I think the technology has probably made it better. And my guess would be there was more cheating uh, in the past. Yeah, I, I still will stick with where I was, which is it's just being caught more uh, than, than it was. The players have been gambling forever. Uh, people have been betting on sports forever. Yep. It's just way easier now on a phone than meeting some guy at the corner grocery store on Sundays to pay your tab. Yeah. Those people now, but it's also, I could argue, more under control because other than the interpreter, you have to bet with money that you deposit. Where with a bookie, other than the interpreter, it's the uh, well, he couldn't have. Other than right, you have it's all money you have, as opposed to the bookies, where it's money that you don't have. And I think the reality is that there isn't supposed to be, there is no easy solution definitionally. And what we're seeing truly is what John had alluded to before, which is something happening slowly, and then suddenly the avalanche of this month specifically, all of it happening at the same time. It's like someone dying. It's really quick at the end, even if they've been dying for years, right? The last day. It's yeah, like that last very, moment. Very fast. I, I once asked somebody how some member of their family was, uh, and they'd been sick, and I said, how's he doing? He said, he's dead. And I said, that's as sick as you can be. <laughs> <laughs> On that perfect note, John Skipper, David Sampson, thank you for spending some of your, some of your days with me, as long as you still have them. Thank you, Pablo. <laughs>